Chapter 9 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 3 by Alexandre Dumas, translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 9 Queen Mary had known the decree of the commissioners these two months. The very day it had been pronounced, she had learned the news through her chaplain, whom they had allowed her to see this once only. Mary Stuart had taken advantage of this visit to give him three letters she had just written, one for Pope Sixtus V, the other to Don Bernard Mendoza, the third to the Duke of Guise. Here is that last letter. 14th December, 1586. My good cousin, whom I hold dearest in the world, I bid you farewell. Being prepared to be put to death by an unjust judgment, and to a death such as no one of our race, thanks to God, and never a queen, and still less one of my rank, has ever suffered. But, good cousin, praise the Lord, for I was useless to the cause of God and of his church in this world, prisoner as I was, while on the contrary I hope that my death will bear witness to my constancies in the faith, and to my willingness to suffer for the maintenance and the restoration of the Catholic Church in this unfortunate island. And though never has executioner dipped his hands in our blood, have no shame of it, my friend, for the judgment of heretics who have no authority over me, a free queen, is profitable in the sight of God to the children of his church. If I adhered, moreover, to what they proposed to me, I should not suffer this stroke. All of our house have been persecuted by this sect. Witness your good father, through whose intercession I hope to be received with mercy by the just judge. I commend to you, then, my poor servants, the discharge of my debts, and the founding of some annual mass for my soul, not at your expense, but that you may make the arrangements as you will be required when you learn my wishes through my poor and faithful servants, who are about to witness my last tragedy. God prosper you, your wife, children, brothers, and cousins, and above all our chief, my good brother and cousin and all his. The blessing of God and that which I shall give to my children be on yours whom I do not commend less to God than my own son, unfortunate and ill-treated as he is. You will receive some rings from me, which will remind you to pray God for the soul of your poor cousin, deprived of all help and counsel except that of the Lord, who gives me strength and courage to alone to resist so many wolves howling after me. To God be the glory. Believe particularly what will be told you by a person who will give you a ruby ring from me, for I take it on my conscience that the truth will be told you of what I have charged him to tell, and especially in what concerns my poor servants and the share of any. I commend this person to you for his simple sincerity and honesty, that he may be placed in some good place. I have chosen him as the least partial and as the one who will most simply bring you my commands. Ignore, I beg you, that he told you anything in particular, for envy might injure him. I have suffered a great deal for two years and more, and have not been able to let you know for an important reason— God be praised for all, and give you grace to persevere in the service of his church as long as you live, and never may this honor pass from our race, while so many men and women are ready to shed their blood to maintain the fight for the faith, all other worldly considerations set aside. And as to me, I esteem myself born on both father's and mother's sides, that I should offer up my blood for this cause, and I have no intention of degenerating. Jesus crucified for us, and all the holy martyrs make us by their intercession worthy of the voluntary offering we make of our bodies to their glory. From Fotheringay, this Thursday, 24th November. They have, thinking to degrade me, pulled down my canopy of state, and since then my keeper has come to offer to write to their queen, saying this deed was not done by his order, but by the advice of some of the council. I have shown them instead of my arms on the said canopy the cross of our Lord. You will hear all this. They have been more gentle since. Your affectionate cousin and perfect friend, Mary, Queen of Scotland, Dowager of France. From this day forward, when she learned the sentence delivered by the commissioners, Mary Stuart no longer preserved any hope, for as she knew Elizabeth's pardon was required to save her, she looked upon herself thenceforward as lost, and only concerned herself with preparing to die well. Indeed, as it had happened to her sometimes from the cold and damp in her prisons, to become crippled for some time in all her limbs, she was afraid of being so when they would come to take her, which would prevent her going resolutely to the scaffold, as she was counting on doing. So, on Saturday the 14th February, she sent for her doctor, Bourgeon, and asked him, moved by a presentiment that her death was at hand, she said what she must do to prevent the return of the pains which crippled her. He replied that it would be good for her to medicine herself with fresh herbs. "'Go, then,' 
said the queen, and ask Sir Amias Paulet from me permission to seek them in the fields. Bourgoin went to Sir Amias, who, as he himself was troubled with sciatica, should have understood better than anyone the need of the remedies for which the queen asked. But this request, simple as it was, raised great difficulties. Sir Amias replied that he could do nothing without referring to his companion, Drury, but that paper and ink might be brought, and that he, Master Bourgoin, could then make a list of the needful plants which they would try to procure. Bourgoin answered that he did not know English well enough, and that the village apothecaries did not know enough Latin for him to risk the queen's life for some error by himself or others. Finally, after a thousand hesitations, Paulet allowed Bourgoin to go out, which he did, accompanied by the apothecary Gourjon, so that the following day the queen was able to begin to doctor herself. Mary Stuart's presentiments had not deceived her. Tuesday, February 17th, at about two o'clock in the afternoon, the earls of Kent and Shrewsbury and Beale sent word to the queen that they desired to speak to her. The queen answered that she was ill and in bed, but that if notwithstanding what they had to tell her was a matter of importance, and they would give her a little time, she would get up. They made answer that the communication they had to make admitted of no delay, that they begged her then to make ready which the queen immediately did, and rising from her bed and cloaking herself, she went and seated herself at a little table on the same spot where she was wont to be great part of the day. Then the two earls, accompanied by Beale, Agnès Poulet, and Drew Drury, entered. Behind them, drawn by curiosity, full of terrible anxiety, came her dearest ladies and most cherished servants. These were, of womankind, the Misses René de Rialli, Gibbes Malbray, Jean Kennedy, Elspeth Curl, Mary Paget and Susan Kirkady, and of menkind, Dominique Bourgoin, her doctor, Pierre Gourjon, her apothecary, Jacques Gervais, her surgeon, Annibal Stuart, her footman, Dither Stiflart, her butler, Jean Laudaire, her baker, and Martine Hoyt, her carver. Then the Earl of Shrewsbury, with head bared like all those present, who remained thus as long as they were in the Queen's room, began to say in English, addressing Mary, Madame, the Queen of England, my august mistress has sent me to you with the earl of kent and sir robert beale here present to make known to you that after having honourably proceeded in the inquiry into the deed of which you are accused and found guilty an inquiry which has already been submitted to your grace by lord buckhurst and having delayed as long as it was in her power the execution of the sentence she can no longer withstand the importunity of her subjects who press her to carry it out so great and loving is their fear for her for this purpose we have come the bearers of a commission, and we beg very humbly, madame, that it may please you to hear it read. "'Read, my lord, I am listening,' replied Mary Stuart with the greatest calmness. Then Robert Beale unrolled the said commission, which was on parchment sealed with the great seal in yellow wax, and read as follows. "'Elizabeth, by the grace of God, Queen of England, France and Ireland, etc., to our beloved and faithful cousins, George, Earl of Shrewsbury, Grand Marshal of England, Henry, Earl of Kent, Henry, Earl of Derby, George, Earl of Cumberland, Henry, Earl of Pembroke, greeting. The Earls of Cumberland, Derby, and Pembroke did not attend to the Queen's orders, and were present neither at the reading of the sentence nor at the execution. Considering the sentence by us given, and others of our council, nobility, and judges, against the former Queen of Scotland bearing the name of Mary, daughter and heiress of James V, King of Scotland, commonly called Queen of Scotland and Dowager of France, which sentence all the estates of our realm and our last Parliament assembled, not only concluded, but, after mature deliberation, ratified as being just and reasonable, considering also the urgent prayer and request of our subjects, begging us and pressing us to proceed to the publication thereof, and to carry it into execution against her person, according as they judge it duly merited, adding in this place that her detention was and would be daily a certain and evident danger, not only to our life, but also to themselves and their posterity, and to the public zeal of this realm, as much on account of the gospel and the true religion of Christ, as of the peace and tranquillity of this state." although the said sentence has been frequently delayed, so that even until this time we abstained from issuing the commission to execute it, yet, for the complete satisfaction of the said demands made by the estates of our Parliament, 
through which daily we hear that all our friends and subjects, as well as the nobility, the wisest, greatest, and most pious, nay, even those of inferior condition, with all humility and affection, from the care they have of our life, and consequently from the fear they have of the destruction of the present divine and happy state of the realm, if we spare the final execution, consenting and desiring the said execution, although the general and continual demands, prayers, counsels, and advice were in such things contrary to our natural inclination, yet, being convinced of the urgent weight of their continual intercessions tending to the safety of our person, and also to the public and private state of our realm, we have at last consented and suffered that justice have its course, and for its execution, considering the singular confidence we have in your fidelity and loyalty together for the love and affection that you have towards us, particularly to the safeguarding of our person and our country, of which you are very noble and chief members, we summon, and for the discharge of it we enjoin you, that at sight of these presents you go to the castle of Fotheringay, where the former Queen of Scotland is, in the care of our friend and faithful servant and counsellor, Sir Amias Pollet, and there take into your keeping and do that by your command execution be done on her person. In the presence of yourselves, and the said Sir Amias Pollet, and of all the other officers of justice whom you command to be there, in the meantime, we have for this end and this execution given warrant in such a way and manner, and in such a time and place, and by such persons, that you five, four, three, or two, find expedient in your discretion, notwithstanding all laws, statutes, and ordinances whatsoever, contrary to these presents, sealed with our great seal of England, which will serve for each of you, and all those who are present, or will make by your order anything pertaining to the execution aforesaid full, and sufficient discharge, for ever." done and given in our house at Greenwich, the first day of February, 10th February, new style, in the twenty-ninth year of our reign. Mary listened to this reading with great calmness and great dignity, then, when it was ended, making the sign of the cross. "'Welcome,' said she, "'to all news which comes in the name of God. Thanks, Lord, for that you deign to put an end to all the ills you have seen me suffer for nineteen years, and more.' "'Madame,' said the Earl of Kent, "'have no ill-will towards us on account of your death. It was necessary to the peace of the state and the progress of the new religion.' "'So,' cried Mary with delight, "'so I shall have the happiness of dying for the faith of my fathers. Thus God deigns to grant me the glory of martyrdom. Thanks, God,' added she, joining with her hands, less excitement but with more piety. "'Thanks to you.' have deigned to destine for me such an end of which i was not worthy that oh my god is indeed a proof of your love and an assurance that you will receive me in the number of your servants for although this sentence has been notified to me i was afraid from the manner in which they have dealt with me for nineteen years of not yet being so near as i am to such a happy end thinking that your queen would not dare to lay a hand on me who by the grace of god am a queen as she is the daughter of a queen as she is, crowned as she is, her near relative, granddaughter of King Henry the Seventh, and who has had the honor of being Queen of France, of which I am still dowager, and this fear was so much the greater, added she, laying her hand on a New Testament which was near her on the little table, that I swear on this holy book I have never attempted, consented to, or even desired the death of my sister, the Queen of England. Madame, replied the Earl of Kent, taking a step towards her and pointing to the New Testament. "'This book on which you have sworn is not genuine, since it is the papist version. Consequently, your oath cannot be considered as any more genuine than the book on which it has been taken.' "'My lord,' answered the Queen, "'what you say may befit you, but not me, who well know that this book is the true and faithful version of the word of the Lord, a version made.' by a very wise divine, a very good man, and approved by the church. Madame, the Earl of Kent returned, your grace stopped at what you were taught in your youth, without inquiry as to whether it was good or bad. It is not surprising, then, that you have remained in your error, for want of having heard any one who could make known the truth to you. This is why, as your grace has but a few hours longer to remain in this world, and consequently has no time to lose, with your permission, we shall send for the Dean of Peterborough, the most learned man there is on the subject of religion, who, with his word, will prepare you for your salvation, which you risk at our great grief, and that of our august queen, 
by all the papistical follies, abominations, and childish nonsense which keep Catholics away from the holy word of God and the knowledge of truth. "'You mistake, my lord,' replied the queen gently. "'If you have believed that I have grown up careless in the faith of my fathers and without seriously occupying myself with a matter so important as religion, I have, on the contrary, spent my life with learned and wise men, who taught me what one must learn on this subject, and I have sustained myself by reading their works, since the means of hearing them has been taken from me. Besides, never having doubted in my lifetime, a doubt is not likely to seize me in my death hour, and there is the Earl of Shrewsbury here present, who will tell you that, since my arrival in England, I have, for an entire Lent of which I repent, heard your wisest doctors, without their arguments having made any impression on my mind. It will be useless, then, my lord." she added, smiling, to summon to one so hardened as I, the Dean of Peterborough, learned as he is. The only thing I ask you in exchange, my lord, and for which I shall be grateful to you beyond expression, is that you will send me my almoner, whom you keep shut up in this house, to console me and prepare me for death, or in his stead another priest, be he who he may, if only a poor priest from a poor village, I being no harder to please than God, and not asking that he have knowledge, provided that he has faith." "'It is with regret, madame,' replied the Earl of Kent, "'that I find myself obliged to refuse your grace's request. "'But it would be contrary to our religion and our conscience, "'and we should be culpable in doing it. "'This is why we again offer you the venerable Dean of Peterborough, "'certain that your grace will find more consolation and content in him "'than in any bishop, priest, or vicar of the Catholic faith.' "'Thank you, my lord,' said the queen again. But I have nothing to do with him, and as I have a conscience free of the crime for which I am about to die, with God's help, martyrdom will take the place of confession for me. And now I remind you, my lord, of what you told me yourself, that I have but a few hours to live, and these few hours to profit me should be passed in prayer and meditation, and not in idle disputes. With these words she rose, and bowing to the earls, Sir Robert Beale, Amyas, and Drury, she indicated by a gesture full of dignity that she wished to be alone and in peace. Then, as they prepared to go out, "'A propos, my lords,' said she, "'for what o'clock should I make ready to die?' Uh, "'For eight o'clock to-morrow, madame,' answered the Earl of Shrewsbury, stammering. "'It is well,' said Mary. "'But you have not some reply to make me, from my sister Elizabeth, relative to a letter which I wrote to her about a month ago?' "'And of what did this letter treat, if it please you, madame?' asked the Earl of Kent. "'Of my burial and my funeral ceremony, my lord. I asked to be interred in France, in the cathedral church of Rheims, near the late queen, my mother.' "'That may not be, madame,' replied the Earl of Kent. But do not trouble yourself as to all these details. The queen, my august mistress, will provide for them as is suitable. Has your grace anything else to ask us? I would also like to know, said Mary, if my servants will be allowed to return each to his own country, with the little that I can give him, which will hardly be enough in any case, for the long service they have done me, and the long imprisonment they have borne on my account. We have no instructions on that head, madame the Earl of Kent said, but we think that an order will be given for this, as for the other things, in accordance with your wishes. Is this all that your grace has to say to us? Yes, my lord, replied the queen, bowing a second time, and now you may withdraw. One moment, my lords, in heaven's name, one moment, cried the old physician, coming forward and throwing himself on his knees before the two earls. What do you want? asked Lord Shrewsbury. "'To point out to you, my lords,' replied the aged Bourgoin, weeping, "'that you have granted the queen but a very short time "'for such an important matter as this of her life. "'Reflect, my lords, what rank and degree "'she whom you have condemned has held among the princes of this earth, "'and consider if it is well and seemly to treat her "'as an ordinary condemned person of middling estate. "'And if not for the sake of this noble queen, my lords,' do this for the sake of us her poor servants who having had the honour of living near her so long cannot thus part from her so quickly and without preparation besides my lords think of it a woman of her state and position ought to have some time in which to set in order her last affairs 
and what will become of her and of us if before dying our mistress has not time to regulate her jointure and her accounts and to put in order her papers and her title deeds she has services to reward and offices of piety to perform she should not neglect the one or the other besides we know that she will only concern herself with us and through this my lords neglect her own salvation grant her then a few more days my lords and as her mistress is too proud to ask of you such a favour i ask you in all our names and implore you not to refuse to poor servants a request which your august queen would certainly not refuse them if they had the good fortune to be able to lay it at her feet is it then true madame sir robert beale asked that you have not yet made a will i have not sir the queen answered in that case my lords said sir robert beale turning to the two earls perhaps it would be a good thing to put it off for a day or two impossible sir replied the earl of shrewsbury the time is fixed and we cannot change anything even by a minute now e enough bourgoin enough said the queen rise i command you bourgoin obeyed and the earl of shrewsbury turning to sir amyas paulet who was behind him sir amyas said he we entrust this lady to your keeping you will charge yourself with her and keep her safe till i return with these words he went out followed by the earl of kent sir robert beale amyas paulet and drury and the queen remained alone with her servants then turning to her women with as serene a countenance as if the event which had just taken place was of little importance well jean said she speaking to kennedy have i not always told you and was i not right that at the bottom of their hearts they wanted to do this and did i not see clearly through all their procedure the end they had in view and know well enough that i was too great an obstacle to their false religion to be allowed to live come continued she hasten supper now that i may put my affairs in order then seeing that instead of obeying her her servants were weeping and lamenting my children said she with a sad smile but without a tear in her eye it is no time for weeping quite the contrary for if you love me you ought to rejoice that the lord in making me die for his cause relieves me from the torments i have endured for nineteen years as for me i thank him for allowing me to die for the glory of his faith and his church let each have patience then and while the men prepare supper we women will pray to god the men immediately went out weeping and sobbing and the queen and her women fell on their knees when they had recited some prayers mary rose and sending for all the money she had left she counted it and divided it into portions which she put into purses with the name of the destined recipient in her handwriting with the money at that moment supper being served she seated herself at table with her women as usual the other servants standing or coming and going her doctor waiting on her at table as he was accustomed since her steward had been taken from her she ate no more nor less than usual speaking throughout supper of the earl of kent and of the way in which he betrayed himself with respect to religion by his insisting on wanting to give the queen a pastor instead of a priest happily <laughs> she added laughing one more skilful than he was needed to change me meanwhile bourgoin was weeping behind the queen for he was thinking that he was serving her for the last time and that she who was eating talking and laughing thus next day at the same hour would be but a cold and insensible corpse when the meal was over the queen sent for all her servants then before the table was cleared of anything she poured out a cup of wine rose and drank to their health asking them if they would not drink to her salvation then she had a glass given to each one all kneeled down and all says the account from which we borrow these details drank mingling their tears with the wine and asking pardon of the queen for any wrongs they had done her the queen granted it heartily and asked them to do as much for her and to forget her impatient ways which she begged them to put down to her imprisonment then having given them a long discourse in which she explained to them their duties to god and exhorted them to persevere in the catholic faith she begged them after her death to live together in peace and charity forgetting all the petty quarrels and disputes which they had had among one another in the past this speech ended the queen rose from table and desired to go into her wardrobe room to see the clothes and jewels she wished to dispose of but bourgoin observed that it would be better to have all these separate objects brought into her chamber and that there would be a double advantage in this she would be less tired for one thing and the english would not see them for another this last reason decided her 
and while the servants were supping she had brought into her ante-room first of all all her robes, and took the inventory from her wardrobe attendant, and began to write in the margin beside each item the name of the person it was to be given to. Directly and as fast as she did it, that person to whom it was given took it and put it aside. As for the things which were too personal to her to be thus bestowed, she ordered that they should be sold, and that the purchase money should be used for her servants' travelling expenses, when they returned to their own countries well knowing how great the cost would be, and that no one would have sufficient means. This memorandum finished, she signed it, and gave it as a discharge to her wardrobe attendant. Then that done, she went into her room, where had been brought her rings, her jewels, and her most valuable belongings, inspected them all, one after the other, down to the very least, and distributed them as she had done her robes, so that, present or absent, everyone had something. Then she furthermore gave to her most faithful people the jewels she intended for the king and queen of France, for the king her son, for the queen mother, for messieurs de Guise and de Lorraine, without forgetting in this distribution any prince or princess among her relatives. She desired, besides, that each should keep the things then in his care, giving her linen to the young lady who looked after it, her silk embroideries to her who took charge of them, her silver plate to her butler, and so on with the rest. Then, as they were asking her for a discharge, "'It is useless,' said she. "'You owe an account to me only, and to-morrow, therefore, you will no longer owe it to any one. But as they pointed out, at the king her son could claim from them. "'You are right,' said she, and she gave them what they asked. That done, and having no hope left of being visited by her confessor, she wrote him this letter. I have been tormented all this day on account of my religion, and urged to receive the consolations of a heretic. You will learn, through Bourgoin and the others, that everything they could say on this matter has been useless, that I have faithfully made protestations of the faith in which I wish to die. I requested that you should be allowed to receive my confession, and to give me the sacrament, which has been cruelly refused, as well as the removal of my body, and the power to make my will freely, so that I cannot write anything except through their hands and with the good pleasure of their mistress. For want of seeing you, then, I confess to you my sins in general, as I should have done in particular, begging you in God's name to watch and pray this night with me, for the remissions of my sins, and to send me your absolution and forgiveness for all the wrongs I have done you. I shall try to see you in their presence, as they permitted it to my steward, and if it is allowed before all and on my knees, I shall ask your blessing. Send me the best prayers you know for this night and for tomorrow morning for the time is short, and I have not the leisure to write. But be calm, I shall recommend you like the rest of my servants, and your benefices above all will be secured to you. Farewell, for I have not much more time. Send to me in writing everything you can find, best for my salvation in prayers and exhortations. I send you my last little ring. Directly had she written this letter, the queen began to make her will, and at a stroke, with her pen running on, and almost without lifting it from the paper, she wrote two large sheets containing several paragraphs, in which no one was forgotten, present as absent, distributing the little she had with scrupulous fairness, and still more according to need than according to service. The executors she chose were the Duke of Guise, her first cousin, the Archbishop of Glasgow, her ambassador, the Bishop of Ross, her chaplain-in-chief, and Monsieur de Rousseau, her chancellor all four certainly very worthy of the charge, the first from his authority, the two bishops in piety and conscience, and the last by his knowledge of affairs. Her will finished, she wrote this letter to the King of France. Sir, my brother-in-law, having by God's permission and for my sins, I believe thrown myself into the arms of this queen, my cousin, where I have had much to endure for more than twenty years, I am by her and by her parliament finally condemned to death, and having asked for my papers, taken from me to make my will, I have not been able to obtain anything to serve me, not even permission to write my last wishes freely, nor leave that after my death my body should be transported, as was my dearest desire, into your kingdom, where I had had the honor of being queen, your sister, and your ally. Today, after dinner, without more respect, my sentence has been declared to me to be executed tomorrow like a criminal at eight o'clock in the morning. I have not the leisure to give you a full account of what has occurred, but if it please you to believe my doctor and these others my distressed servants, you will hear the truth, and that, thanks to God, I despise death, which I protest I receive innocent of every crime, even if I were their subject, which I never was. But my faith in the Catholic religion and my claims to the crown of England are the real causes for my condemnation, and yet they will not allow me to say that it is for religion I die, for my religion kills theirs 
and that is so true that they have taken my chaplain from me who although a prisoner in the same castle may not come either to console me or to give me the holy sacrament of the eucharist but on the contrary they have made me urgent entreaties to receive the consolations of their minister whom they have brought for this purpose he who will bring you this letter and the rest of my servants who are your subjects for the most part will bear your witness of the way in which i shall have performed my last act now it remains to me to implore you as a most christian king as my brother-in-law as my ancient ally and one who has so often done me the honour to protest your friendship for me to give proof of this friendship in your virtue and your charity by helping me in that of which i cannot without you discharge my conscience that is to say in rewarding my good distressed servants by giving them their dues then in having prayers made to god for a queen who has been called most christian and who dies a catholic and deprived of all her goods as to my son i commend him to you as much as he shall deserve for i cannot answer for him but as to my servants i commend them with clasped hands i have taken the liberty of sending you two rare stones good for the health hoping that yours may be perfect during a long life you will receive them as coming from your very affectionate sister-in-law at the point of death and giving proof of her good disposition towards you i shall commend my servants to you in a memorandum and will order you for the good of my soul for whose salvation it will be employed to pay me a portion of what you owe me if it please you and i conjure you for the honour of jesus to whom i shall pray to-morrow at my death that you leave me the wherewithal to found a mass and to perform the necessary charities this wednesday two hours after midnight your affectionate and good sister mary of all these recommendations the will and the letters the queen at once had copies made which she signed so that if some should be seized by the english the others might reach their destination bourgoin pointed out to her that she was wrong to be in such a hurry to close them and that perhaps in two or three hours she would remember that she had something left out but the queen paid no attention saying she was sure she had not forgotten anything and that if she had she had only time now to pray and to look to her conscience so she shut up all the several articles in the drawers of a piece of furniture and gave the key to bourgoin then sending for a foot-bath in which she stayed for about ten minutes she lay down in bed where she was not seen to sleep but constantly to repeat prayers or to remain in meditation towards four o'clock in the morning the queen who was accustomed after evening prayers to have the story of some male or female saint read aloud to her did not wish to depart from this habit and after having hesitated among several for this solemn occasion she chose the greatest sinner of all the penitent thief saying humbly if great sinner as he was he has yet sinned less than i i desire to beg of him in remembrance of the passion of jesus christ to have pity on me in the hour of my death as our lord had pity on him then when the reading was over she had all her handkerchiefs brought and chose the finest which was of delicate cambric all embroidered in gold to bandage her eyes with at daybreak reflecting that she had only two hours to live she rose and began dressing but before she had finished bourgoin came into her room and afraid lest the absent servants might murmur against the queen if by chance they were discontented at the will and might accuse those who had been present of having taken away from their share to add to their own he begged mary to send for them all and to read it in their presence to which mary agreed and consented to do so at once all the servants were then summoned and the queen read her testament saying that it was done of her own free will full and entire written and signed with her own hand and that accordingly she begged those present to give all the help in their power and seeing it carried out without change or omission then having read it over and having received a promise from all she gave it to bourgoin charging him to send it to monsieur de guise her chief executor and at the same time to forward her letters to the king and her principal papers and memorandums after this she had the casket brought in which she had put the purses which we mentioned before she opened them one after another and seeing by the ticket within for whom each was intended she distributed them with her own hand none of the recipients being aware of their contents these gifts varied from twenty to three hundred crowns and to these sums she added seven hundred livres for the poor namely two hundred for the poor of england and five hundred for the poor of france then she gave to each man in her suite two rose nobles to be distributed in alms for her sake and finally one hundred and fifty crowns to bourgoin to be divided among them all when they should separate and thus twenty-six or twenty-seven people had money legacies the queen performed all this with great composure and calmness with no apparent change of countenance so that it seemed as if she were only preparing for a journey or a change of dwelling 
Then she again bade her servants farewell, consoling them and exhorting them to live in peace, all this while finishing dressing as well as elegantly as she could. Her toilet ended, the queen went from her reception room to her ante-room, where there was an altar set up and arranged, at which, before he had been taken from her, her chaplain used to say mass, and kneeling on the steps, surrounded by all her servants, she began the communion prayers, and when they were ended, drawing from the golden box a host consecrated by Pius V, which she had always scrupulously preserved for the occasion of her death, she told Bourgoin to take it, and, as he was the senior, to take the priest's place, old age being holy and sacred, and in this manner, in spite of all the precautions taken to deprive her of it, the queen received the holy sacrament of the Eucharist. The pious ceremony ended. Bourgoin told the queen that in her will she had forgotten three people, Mesdemoiselles Beauregard, de Montbrun, and her chaplain. The queen was greatly astonished at this oversight, which was quite involuntary, and taking back her will, she wrote her wishes with respect to them in the first empty margin. Then she kneeled down again in prayer. But after a moment, as she suffered too much in this position, she rose, and Bourgoin, having had brought her a little bread and wine, she ate and drank. And when she had finished, gave him her hand and thanked him for having been present to help her at her last meal, as he was accustomed, and feeling stronger she kneeled down and began to pray again. Scarcely had she done so, then there was a knocking at the door. The queen understood what was required of her, but as she had not yet finished praying, she begged those who were to come fetch her to wait a moment, and in a few minutes she would be ready. The earls of Kent and Shrewsbury, remembering the resistance she had made when she had had to go down to the commissioners and appear before the lawyers, mounted some guards in the ante-room where they were waiting themselves, so that they could take her away by force if necessary, should she refuse to come willingly, or should her servants want to defend her. But it is untrue that the two barons entered her room, as some have said. They only set foot there once, on the occasion which we have related, when they came to apprise her of her sentence. They waited some minutes, nevertheless, as the queen had begged them. Then about eight o'clock they knocked again, accompanied by the guards, but to their great surprise the door was opened immediately, and they found Mary on her knees in prayer. Upon this, Sir Thomas Andrew, who was at the time sheriff of the county of Nottingham, entered alone, a white wand in his hand, and as everyone stayed on their knees praying, he crossed the room with a slow step and stood behind the queen. He waited a moment there, and as Mary Stuart did not seem to see him, "'Madame,' said he, "'the earls have sent me to you.' At these words the queen turned round, and at once rising in the middle of her prayer, "'Let us go,' she replied, and she made ready to follow him. Then Bourgoin, taking the cross of black wood, with an ivory Christ which was over the altar, said, "'Madame, would you not like to take this little cross?' "'Thank you for having reminded me,' Mary answered. "'I had intended to, but I forgot.' Then, giving it to Annibal Stuart, her footman, that he might present it when she should ask for it, she began to move to the door, and on account of the great pain in her limbs, leaning on Bourgoin, who, as they draw near, suddenly let her go, saying, "'Madame, your majesty knows, if we love you and all, such as we are, are ready to obey you, should you command us to die for you. But I—' I have not the strength to lead you farther. Besides, it is not becoming that we who should be defending you at the last drop of our blood should seem to be betraying you and giving you thus into the hands of these infamous English. You are right, Bourgoin, said the queen. Moreover, my death would be a sad sight for you, which I ought to spare your age and your friendship. Mr. Sheriff, added she, call someone to support me, for you see that I cannot walk. The sheriff bowed, and signed to two guards, whom he had kept hidden behind the door, to lend him assistance in case the queen should resist, to approach and support her, which they at once did, and Mary Stuart went on her way, preceded and followed by her servants, weeping and wringing their hands. But at the second door other guards stopped them, telling them they must go no farther. They all cried out against such a prohibition. They said that for the nineteen years they had been shut up with the queen they had always accompanied her wherever she went that it was frightful to deprive their mistress of their services at the last moment, and that such an order had doubtless been given because they wanted to practice some shocking cruelty on her, of which they desired no witnesses. Bourgoin, who was at their head, seeing that he could obtain nothing by threats or entreaties, asked to speak with the earls, but this claim was not allowed either, and as the servants wanted to pass by force, the soldiers repulsed them with blows of their arquebuses, then raising her voice. "'It is wrong of you to prevent my servants following me.' said the queen, and I begin to think, like them, that you have some ill designs upon me beyond my death. 
The sheriff replied, "'Madame, four of your servants are chosen to follow you, and no more. When you have come down, they will be fetched, and will rejoin you.' "'What?' said the queen. "'The four chosen persons cannot even follow me now.' "'The order is thus given by the earls,' answered the sheriff, "'and to my great regret, madame, I can do nothing.' Then the queen turned to them, and taking the cross from Annibal Stuart, and in her other hand her book of hours and her handkerchief, "'My children,' said she, "'this is one more grief to add to our other griefs. Let us bear it like Christians, and offer this fresh sacrifice to God.' At these words sobs and cries burst forth on all sides. The unhappy servants fell on their knees, and while some rolled on the ground, tearing their hair, others kissed her hands her knees, and the hem of her gown, begging her forgiveness for every possible fault, calling her their mother and bidding her farewell. Finding no doubt that this scene was lasting too long, the sheriff made a sign, and the soldiers pushed the men and women back into the room and shut the door on them. Still, fast as was the door, the queen nonetheless heard their cries and lamentations, which seemed, in spite of the guards, as if they would accompany her to the scaffold. At the stairhead the queen found Andrew Melville awaiting her. He was the master of her household, who had been secluded from her for some time, and who was at last permitted to see her once more to say farewell. The queen, hastening her steps, approached him, and kneeling down to receive his blessing, which he gave her, weeping. Melville, said she, without rising and addressing him as thou for the first time, as thou hast been an honest servant to me, be the same to my son. Seek him out directly after my death, and tell him of it in every detail. Tell him that I wish him well, and that I beseech God to send him his Holy Spirit. Madame, replied Melville, this is certainly the saddest message with which a man can be charged. No matter, I shall faithfully fulfill it, I swear to you. What sayest thou, Melville? responded the Queen, rising. And what better news canst thou bear on the contrary than that I am delivered from all my ills? Tell him that he should rejoice, since the sufferings of Mary Stuart are at an end. Tell him that I die a Catholic, constant in my religion, faithful to Scotland and France, and that I forgive those who put me to death. Tell him that I have always desired the union of England and Scotland. Tell him, finally, that I have done nothing injurious to his kingdom, to his honour, or to his rights. And thus, good Belleville, till we meet again in heaven. Then, leaning on the old man, whose face was bathed in tears, she descended the staircase, at the foot of which she found the two earls, Sir Henry Talbot, Lord Shrewsbury's son, Amyas Paulet, Drew Jury, Robert Beale, and many gentlemen of the neighbourhood. The queen, advancing towards them without pride, but without humility, complained that her servants had been refused permission to follow her, and asked that it should be granted. The lords conferred together, and a moment after the Earl of Kent inquired which one she desired to have, saying she might be allowed six. So the queen chose from among the men Bourgoin, Gordon, Gervais, and Didier, and from the women Jeanne Kennedy and Elspeth Curl, the one she preferred to all, though the latter was sister to the secretary who had betrayed her. But here arose a fresh difficulty, the earls saying that this permission did not extend to women, women not being used to be present at such sights, and when they were, usually upsetting everyone with cries and lamentations and as soon as the decapitation was over, rushing to the scaffold to staunch the blood with their handkerchiefs, a most unseemly proceeding. "'My lords,' then said the queen, "'I answer and promise for my servants that they will not do any of the things your honours fear. Alas, poor people! They would be very glad to bid me farewell, and I hope that your mistress, being a maiden queen and accordingly sensitive for the honour of women, has not given you such strict orders that you are unable to grant me the little I ask.' So much the more, added she in a profoundly mournful tone, that my rank should be taken into consideration, for indeed I am your queen's cousin, granddaughter of Henry the Seventh, queen dowager of France, and crowned queen of Scotland. The lords consulted together for another moment and granted her demands. Accordingly, two guards went up immediately to fetch the chosen individuals. The queen then moved on to the great hall, leaning on two of Sir Amias Paulet's gentlemen, accompanied and followed by the earls and lords, the sheriff walking before her and Andrew Melville bearing her train. Her dress, as carefully chosen as possible, as we have said, consisted of a coif of fine cambric, trimmed with lace, with a lace veil thrown back and falling to the ground. 
She wore a cloak of black stamped satin lined with black taffetas and trimmed in front with sable, with a long train and sleeves hanging to the ground. The buttons were of jet in the shape of acorns and surrounded with pearls, her collar in the Italian style, her doublet was of figured black satin, and underneath she wore stays laced behind in crimson satin, edged with velvet of the same color, a gold cross hung by a pomander chain at her neck, and two rosaries at her girdle. It was thus she entered the great hall where the scaffold was erected. It was a platform twelve feet wide, raised about two feet from the floor, surrounded with barriers and covered with black serge, and on it were a little chair, a cushion to kneel on, and a block also covered in black. Just as, having mounted the steps, she set foot on the fatal boards, the executioner came forward, and, asking forgiveness for the duty he was about to perform, kneeled, hiding behind him his axe. Mary saw it, however, and cried, "'Ah! Oh, I would rather have been beheaded in the French way, with a sword!' "'It is not my fault, madame,' said the executioner, "'if this last wish of your majesty cannot be fulfilled. But, not having been instructed to bring a sword, and having found this axe here only, I am obliged to use it. Will that prevent your pardoning me, then?' "'I pardon you, my friend,' said Mary, "'and in proof of it here is my hand to kiss.' The executioner put his lips to the queen's hand, rose and approached the chair. Mary sat down, and the earls of Kent and Shrewsbury standing on her left, the sheriff and his officers before her, Amyas Poulet behind, and outside the barrier the lords, knights, and gentlemen, numbering nearly two hundred and fifty, Robert Beale for the second time read the warrant for execution, and as he was beginning the servants who had been fetched came into the hall and placed themselves behind the scaffold. The men mounted upon a bench put back against the wall and the women kneeling in front of it, and a little spaniel, of which the queen was very fond, came quietly, as if he feared to be driven away and lay down near his mistress. The queen listened to the reading of the warrant without seeming to pay much attention, as if it had concerned someone else and with a countenance as calm and even as joyous as if it had been a pardon and not a sentence of death. Then, when Beale had ended, and having ended, cried in a loud voice, "'God save Queen Elizabeth!' to which no one made any response. Mary signed herself with the cross, and rising without any change of expression, and on the contrary lovelier than ever. "'My lords,' said she, "'I am a queen-born sovereign princess and not subject to law.' a near relation of the Queen of England and her rightful heir. For a long time I have been a prisoner in this country. I have suffered here much tribulation and many evils that no one had the right to inflict, and now, to crown all, I am about to lose my life. Well, my lords, bear witness that I die in the Catholic faith, thanking God for letting me die for his holy cause, and protesting today, as every day in public as in private, that I have never plotted, consented to, nor desired the Queen's death, nor any other thing against her person, but that, on contrary, I have always loved her, and have always offered her good and reasonable conditions, to put an end to the troubles of the kingdom, and deliver me from captivity, without my having ever been honoured with a reply from her, and all this, my lords, you well know. Finally, my enemies have attained their end, which was to put me to death. I do not pardon them less for it than I pardon all those who have attempted anything against me. After my death the authors of it will be known, but I die without accusing any one for fear the Lord should hear me and avenge me." Upon this, whether he was afraid that such a speech by so great a queen should soften the assembly too much, or whether he found that all these words were making too much delay, the dean of Peterborough placed himself before Mary and leaning on the barrier. "'Madame,' he said, "'my much-honoured mistress has commanded me to come to you.' But at these words Mary, turning and interrupting him, "'Mr. Dean,' she answered in a loud voice, "'I have nothing to do with you. I do not wish to hear you, and beg you to withdraw.' "'Madame,' said the dean, persisting, in spite of this resolve expressed in such firm and precise terms, "'you have but a moment longer. Change your opinions, abjure your errors, and put your faith in Jesus Christ alone, that you may be saved through him.' "'Everything you can say is useless,' replied the queen and you will gain nothing by it. Be silent, then, I beg you, and let me die in peace." And as she saw that he wanted to go on, she sat down on the other side of the chair and turned her back to him. But the dean immediately walked round the scaffold till he faced her again. Then, as he was going to speak, the queen turned about once more and sat, as at first, seeing which the Earl of Shrewsbury said, "'Madame, truly I despair that you are so attached to this folly of papacy. Allow us, if it please you, to pray for you.' 
"'My lord,' answered the queen, "'if you desire to pray for me, I thank you, for the intention is good. But I cannot join in your prayers, for we are not of the same religion.' The earls then called the dean, and while the queen, seated in her little chair, was praying in a low tone, he, kneeling on the scaffold steps, prayed aloud, and the whole assembly except the queen and her servants prayed after him. Then, in the midst of her orison, which she said with her Agnes Dei around her neck, a crucifix in one hand and her book of hours in the other, she fell from her seat on to her knees, praying aloud in Latin, whilst the others prayed in English. And when the others were silent, she continued in English in her turn, so that they could hear her, praying for the afflicted Church of Christ, for an end to the persecution of Catholics, and for the happiness of her son's reign. Then she said, in accents full of faith and fervor, that she hoped to be saved by the merits of Jesus Christ, at the foot of whose cross she was going to shed her blood. At these words, the Earl of Kent could no longer contain himself, and without respect for the sanctity of the moment, "'Oh, madame!' said he, "'put to Jesus Christ in your heart, and reject all this rubbish of popish deceptions.' But she, without listening, went on, praying the saints to intercede with God for her, and kissing the crucifix, she cried, "'Lord, Lord, receive me in thy arms outstretched on the cross, and forgive me all my sins.' Thereupon, she being again seated in the chair, the Earl of Kent asked her if she had any confessions to make, to which she replied that not being guilty of anything, to confess would be to give herself the lie. "'It is well,' the Earl answered. "'Then, madame, prepare.' The queen rose, and as the executioner approached to assist her disrobe, "'Allow me, my friend,' said she. "'I know how to do it better than you, and am not accustomed to undress before so many spectators, nor to be served by such valets.' And then calling her two women, she began to unpin her coiffure, and as Jean Kennedy and Elspeth Curl, while performing this last service for their mistress, could not help weeping bitterly, "'Do not weep,' she said to them in French for I have promised and answered for you. With these words she made the sign of the cross upon the forehead of each, kissed them, and recommended them to pray for her. Then the queen began to undress, herself assisting, as she was wont to do when preparing for bed, and taking the gold cross from her neck she wished to give it to Jean, saying to the executioner, "'My friend, I know that all I have upon me belongs to you, but this is not in your way. Let me bestow it, if you please, on this young lady, and she will give you twice its value in money.' But the executioner, hardly allowing her to finish, snatched it from her hands with, "'It is my right.' The queen was not moved much by this brutality, and went on taking off her garments until she was simply in her petticoat. Thus, rid of all her garb, she again sat down, and Jean Kennedy, approaching her, took from her pocket the handkerchief of gold-embroidered cambric, which she had prepared the night before and bound her eyes with it, which the earls, lords, and gentlemen looked upon with great surprise, in not being customary in England, and as she thought that she was to be beheaded in the French way, that is to say, seated in the chair, she held herself upright, motionless, and with her neck stiffened to make it easier for the executioner, who, for his part, not knowing how to proceed, was standing without striking axe in hand. At last the man laid his hand on the queen's head, and drawing her forward, made her fall to her knees. Mary then understood what was required of her, and feeling for the block with her hands, which were still holding her book of hours and her crucifix, she laid her neck on it, her hands joined beneath her chin, that she might pray till the last moment. The executioner's assistant drew them away, for fear they should be cut off with her head, and as the queen was saying, "'In menes teus domine,' the executioner raised his axe, which was simply an axe for chopping wood, and struck the first blow, which hit too high and piercing the skull made the crucifix and the book fly from the condemned's hands by its violence, but which did not sever the head. However stunned with the blow, the queen made no movement, which gave the executioner time to redouble it, but still the head did not fall and a third stroke was necessary to detach a shred of flesh which held it to the shoulders. At last, when the head was quite severed, the executioner held it up to show the assembly, saying, "'God save Queen Elizabeth!' "'So perish all Her Majesty's enemies,' responded the Dean of Peterborough. "'Amen,' said the Earl of Kent. But he was the only one. No other voice could respond, for all were choked with sobs. At that moment the Queen's headdress falling disclosed her hair, cut very short, and as white as if she had been aged seventy. 
As to her face, it had so changed during her death agony that no one would have recognized it had he not known it was hers. The spectators cried out aloud at this sign, for frightful to see, the eyes were open, and the lids went on moving as if they would still pray, and this muscular movement lasted for more than a quarter of an hour after the head had been cut off. The queen's servants had rushed upon the scaffold, picking up the book of hours and the crucifix as relics, and Jean Kennedy, remembering the little dog who had come to his mistress, looked about for him on all sides, seeking him and calling him. But she sought and called in vain, he had disappeared. At that moment, as one of the executioners was untying the queen's garters, which were of blue satin embroidered in silver, he saw the poor little animal which had hidden in her petticoat, and which he was obliged to bring out by force. Then, having escaped from his hands, it took refuge between the queen's shoulders and her head, which the executioner had laid down near the trunk. Jean took him then, in spite of his howls, and carried him away, covered with blood, for everyone had just been ordered to leave the hall. Bourgoin and Gervais stayed behind, entreating Sir Amias Paulet to let them take the queen's heart, that they might carry it to France as they had promised her, but they were harshly refused and pushed out of the hall, of which all the doors were closed, and there remained only the executioner and the corpse. Brantome relates that something infamous took place there. End of chapter 9. Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia. Chapter 10 of Celebrated Crimes, Volume 3 by Alexander Dumas. Translated by George Burnham Ives. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 10. Two hours after the execution, the body and the head were taken into the same hall in which Mary Stuart had appeared before the commissioners, set down on a table round which the judges had sat, and covered over with a black serge cloth, and there remained till three o'clock in the afternoon, when Waters, the doctor from Stamford and the surgeon from Fotheringay Village, came to open and embalm them, an operation which they carried out under the eyes of Amias Poulet and his soldiers, without any respect for the rank and sex of the poor corpse, which was thus exposed to the view of any one who wanted to see it. It is true that this indignity did not fulfill its proposed aim, for a rumor spread about that the queen had swollen limbs and was dropsical, while, on the contrary, there was not one of the spectators but was obliged to confess that he had never seen the body of a young girl in the bloom of health purer and lovelier than that of Mary Stuart, dead of a violent death after nineteen years of suffering and captivity. When the body was opened, the spleen was in its normal state, with the veins a little livid only, the lungs yellowish in places, and the brain one-sixth larger than is usual in persons of the same age and sex. Thus everything promised a long life to her whose end had just been so cruelly hastened. A report having been made of the above, the body was embalmed after a fashion, put in a leaden coffin, and that in another of wood, which was left on the table till the first day of August, that is, for nearly five months before any one was allowed to come near it. And not only that, but the English having noticed that Mary Stuart's unhappy servants, who were still detained as prisoners, went to look at it through the keyhole, stopped that up in such a way that they could not even gaze at the coffin enclosing the body of her whom they had so greatly loved. However, one hour after Mary Stuart's death, Henry Talbot, who had been present at it, set out at full speed for London, carrying to Elizabeth the account of her rival's death. But at the very first line she read, Elizabeth, true to her character, cried out in grief and indignation, saying that her orders had been misunderstood, that there had been too great haste, and that all this was the fault of Davison, the Secretary of State, to whom she had given the warrant to keep till she had made up her mind, but not to send to Fotheringay. Accordingly, Davison was sent to the Tower and condemned to pay a fine of ten thousand pounds sterling for having deceived the Queen. Meanwhile, amid all this grief, an embargo was laid on all vessels in all the ports of the realm, so that the news of the death should not reach abroad, especially France, except through skilful emissaries who could place the execution in the least unfavorable light for Elizabeth. At the same time, the scandalous popular festivities which had marked the announcement of the sentence again celebrated the tidings of the execution. London was illuminated, bonfires lit, and the enthusiasm was such that the French embassy was broken into and wood taken to revive the fires when they began to die down. Crestfallen at this event, 
Monsieur de Chateauneuf was still shut up at the embassy, when a fortnight later he received an invitation from Elizabeth to visit her at the country house of the Archbishop of Canterbury. Monsieur de Chateauneuf went thither with the firm resolve to say no word to her on what had happened. But as soon as she saw him, Elizabeth, dressed in black, rose, went to him, and overwhelming him with kind attentions, told him that she was ready to place all the strength of her kingdom at Henry III's disposal to help him put down the League. Chateauneuf received all these offers with a cold and severe expression, without saying, as he had promised himself, a single word about the event which had put both the Queen and himself into mourning. But taking him by the hand, she drew him aside, and there, with deep sighs, said, "'Ah, sir, since I saw you, the greatest misfortune which could befall me has happened. I mean the death of my good sister, the Queen of Scotland, of which I swear by God himself, my soul, and my salvation, that I am perfectly innocent. I had signed the order, it is true, but my counsellors have played me a trick for which I cannot calm myself, and I swear to God that if it were not for their long service I would have them beheaded. I have a woman's frame, sir.' but in this woman's frame beats a man's heart. Chateauneuf bowed without a response, but his letter to Henry the Third and Henry's answer proved that neither the one nor the other was the dupe of this female Tiberius. Meanwhile, as we have said, the unfortunate servants were prisoners, and the poor body was in that great hall waiting for a royal internment. Things remained thus, Elizabeth said, to give her time to order a splendid funeral for her good sister Mary, but in reality because the queen dared not place in juxtaposition the secret and infamous death and the public and royal burial. Then was not time needed for the first reports which it pleased Elizabeth to spread to be credited before the truth should be known by the mouths of the servants? For the queen hoped that once this careless world had made up its mind about the death of the queen of Scots, it would not take any further trouble to change it. Finally, it was only when the warders were as tired as the prisoners that Elizabeth, having received the report stating that the ill-embalmed body could no longer be kept, at last ordered the funeral to take place. Accordingly, after the first of August, tailors and dressmakers arrived at Fotheringay Castle, sent by Elizabeth, with cloth and black silk stuffs, to clothe in mourning all Mary's servants. But they refused, not having waited for the Queen of England's bounty, but having made their funeral garments at their own expense, immediately after their mistress's death. The tailors and dressmakers, however, none the less, set so actively to work that on the seventh everything was finished. Next day, at eight o'clock in the evening, a large chariot drawn by four horses in mourning trappings and covered with black velvet like the chariot, which was besides adorned with little streamers on which were embroidered the arms of Scotland, those of the Queen, and the arms of Aragon, those of Darnley, stopped at the gate of Fotheringay Castle. It was followed by the Herald King, accompanied by twenty gentlemen on horseback, with their servants and lackeys all dressed in mourning, who, having alighted, mounted with his whole train into the room where the body lay, and had it brought down and put into the chariot with all possible respect, each of the spectators standing with bared head and in profound silence. This visit caused a great stir among the prisoners, who debated a while whether they ought not to implore the favor of being allowed to follow their mistress's body, which they could not and should not let go alone thus. But just as they were about to ask permission to speak to the herald king, he entered the room where they were assembled and told them that he was charged by his mistress, the august Queen of England, to give the Queen of Scotland the most honourable funeral he could, that, not wishing to fail in such a high undertaking, he had already made most of the preparations for the ceremony which was to take place on the 10th of August, that is to say, two days later, but that the leaden shell in which the body was enclosed being very heavy, it was better to move it beforehand, and that night, to where the grave was dug, than to await the day of the interment itself that thus they might be easy, this burial of the shell being only a preparatory ceremony, but that if some of them would like to accompany the corpse to see what was done with it they were at liberty, and that those who stayed behind could follow the funeral pageant, Elizabeth's positive desire being that all, from first to last, should be present in the funeral procession. This assurance calmed the unfortunate prisoners who deputed Bourgoin, Gervais, and six others to follow their mistress's body. These were Andrew Melville, Stuart, Gourjon, Howard, Laudet, and Nicolas de la Mar. At ten o'clock at night they set out, walking behind the chariot, preceded by the herald, accompanied by men on foot, who carried torches to light the way, and followed by twenty gentlemen and their servants. 
In this manner, at two o'clock in the morning, they reached Peterborough, where there is a splendid cathedral built by an ancient Saxon king, and in which, on the left of the choir, was already interred good Queen Catherine of Aragon, wife of Henry VIII, and where was her tomb still decked with a canopy bearing her arms. On arriving, they found the cathedral all hung with black, with a dome erected in the middle of the choir, much in the way in which a chapelle ardente is set up in France, except that there were no lighted candles round it. This dome was covered with black velvet and overlaid with the arms of Scotland and Aragon, with streamers like those on the chariot yet again repeated. The state coffin was already set up under this dome. It was a bier, covered like the rest in black velvet fringed with silver, on which was a pillow of the same supporting a royal crown. To the right of this dome, and in front of the burial place of Queen Catherine of Aragon, Mary of Scotland's sepulchre had been dug. It was a grave of brick, arranged to be covered later with a slab or a marble tomb, and in which was to be deposited the coffin, which the bishop of Peterborough in his episcopal robes, but without his mitre, cross, or cope, was awaiting at the door, accompanied by his dean and several other clergy. The body was brought into the cathedral without chant or prayer, and was let down into the tomb amid a profound silence. Directly it was placed there, the masons, who stayed their hands, set to work again, closing the grave level with the floor and only leaving an opening of about a foot and a half, through which could be seen what was within, and through which could be thrown on the coffin, as is customary at the obsequies of kings, the broken staves of the officers and the ensigns and banners with their arms. This nocturnal ceremony ended, Melville, Bourgoin, and the other deputies were taken to the bishop's palace, where the persons appointed to take part in the funeral procession were to assemble. In number more than three hundred and fifty, all chosen, with the exception of the servants from among the authorities, the nobility, and Protestant clergy. The day following, Thursday, August the ninth, they began to hang the banqueting halls with rich and sumptuous stuffs, and that in the sight of Melville, Bourgoin, and the others, whom they had brought thither, less to be present at the interment of Queen Mary than to bear witness to the magnificence of Queen Elizabeth. But, as one may suppose, the unhappy prisoners were indifferent to this splendor, great and extraordinary as it was. On Friday, August 10th, all the chosen persons assembled at the bishop's palace. They ranged themselves in the appointed order and turned their steps to the cathedral, which was close by. When they arrived there, they took the places assigned them in the choir, and the choristers immediately began to chant a funeral service in English and according to Protestant rites. At the first words of this service, when he saw it was not conducted by Catholic priests, Bourgoin left the cathedral, declaring that he would not be present at such sacrilege, and he was followed by all Mary's servants, men and women except Melville and Barb Mowbray, who thought that whatever the tongue in which one prayed, that tongue was heard by the Lord. This exit created great scandal, but the bishop preached none the less. The sermon ended, the herald king went to seek Bourgoin and his companions, who were walking in the cloisters, and told them that the almsgiving was about to begin, inviting them to take part in the ceremony. But they replied that, being Catholics, they could not make offerings at an altar of which they disapproved. So the herald king returned, much put out at the harmony of the assembly being disturbed by this dissent. But the alms offering took place no less than the sermon. Then, as a last attempt, he sent to them again to tell them that the service was quite over, and that accordingly they might return for the royal ceremonies which belonged only to the religion of the dead, and this time they consented. But when they arrived, the staves were broken and the banners thrown into the grave through the opening that the workmen had already closed. Then, in the same order in which it had come, the procession returned to the palace where a splendid funeral repast had been prepared. By a strange contradiction, Elizabeth, who, having punished the living woman as a criminal, had just treated the dead woman as a queen, had also wished that the honors of the funeral banquet should be for the servants, so long forgotten by her. But, as one can imagine, these ill-accommodated themselves to that intention, did not seem astonished at this luxury, nor rejoiced at this good cheer, but on the contrary drowned their bread and wine in tears, without otherwise responding to the questions put to them or the honors granted them and as soon as the repast was ended the poor servants left Peterborough and took the road back to Fotheringay, where they heard that they were free at last to withdraw whither they would. They did not need to be told twice, for they lived in perpetual fear, not considering their lives safe so long as they remained in England. They therefore immediately collected all their belongings, each taking his own, and thus went out to Fotheringay Castle on foot, Monday, 13th August, 1587. Bourgoin went last. Having reached the farther side of the drawbridge, he turned, and Christian as he was, unable to forgive Elizabeth not for his own sufferings, but for his mistresses, he faced about to those regicide walls, and with hands outstretched to them, said in a loud and threatening voice, these words of David, 
let vengeance for the blood of thy servants which has been shed o lord god be accepted in thy sight the old man's curse was heard an inflexible history is burdened with elizabeth's punishment we said that the executioner's axe in striking mary stuart's head had caused the crucifix and the book of hours which she was holding to fly from her hands we also said that the two relics had been picked up by people in her following we are not aware of what became of the crucifix but the book of hours is in the royal library where the curious about these kinds of historical souvenirs can see it two certificates inscribed on one of the blank leaves of the volume demonstrate its authenticity these are they first certificate we the undersigned vicar superior of the strict observance of the order of cluny certify that this book has been entrusted to us by order of the defunct dom michel nardin a professed religious priest of our said observance deceased in our college of saint martial of avignon march twenty eighth seventeen twenty three aged about eighty years of which he has spent about thirty among us having lived very religiously he was a german by birth and had served as an officer in the army a long time he entered cluny and made his profession there much detached from all this world's goods and honors he only kept with his superior's permission this book which he knew had been in use with mary stuart queen of england and scotland to the end of her life before dying and being parted from his brethren he requested that to be safely remitted to us it should be sent us by mail sealed just as we have received it we have begged m l'abbe bignon counsellor of state and king's librarian to accept this precious relic of the piety of a queen of england and of a german officer of her religion as well as of ours signed brother gerard Ponce, vicar general superior second certificate we jean paul bignon king's library are very happy to have an opportunity of exhibiting our zeal in placing the said manuscript in his majesty's library 8th July, 1724. Signed, Jean-Paul Bignon. This manuscript, on which was fixed the last gaze of the Queen of Scotland, is a duodecimo, written in the Gothic character and containing Latin prayers. It is adorned with miniatures set off with gold, representing devotional subjects, stories from sacred history, or from the lives of saints and martyrs. Every page is encircled with arabesques mingled with garlands of fruit and flowers, amid which spring up grotesque figures of men and animals as to the binding worn now or perhaps even then to the wolf it is in a black velvet of which the flat covers are adorned in the centre with an enamelled pansy in a silver setting surrounded by a wreath to which are diagonally attached from one corner of the cover to the other two twisted silver gilt and knotted cords finished by a tuft at the two ends end of chapter ten end of celebrated crimes volume three mary stuart by alexandre dumas Translated by George Burnham Ives. Recording by John Vanstan, Savannah, Georgia.